Welcome to the River Podcast. My name is Ethan Rillensteel, joined by Ryan Mastalk Matheson and our NFL man, Elson Gratz, the guy from NFL Psychics. Um, let's start out with this new phenomenon called Mass Talk Sports. Ryan, let's break this down. Yeah, I mean, I announced this last week on the episode that I was going to be uh, creating an Instagram account. I had the first post um, between now and then, and people seem to like it, so I'll keep doing it probably about once a week. There we go. Um, that first post, I would say, it was pretty iconic, uh, you know, being one of the first people to wish the 49ers, correct? Yeah, I was one of the yeah, first people to officially congratulate the 49ers and the Chiefs. Not yet, right, in the Chiefs. Yeah, uh, so I'm super excited. Make sure you check him out. That's It's strictly Instagram, correct? Yep, just Instagram. All right, there you go. So so we officially have Ryan Madison of Math Talk Sports, and we got Elson Gratz of NFL Psychics. Elson, how's that been going? We're going to get to this a little later, but how's, how's the NFL Psychics going? I'm getting closer and closer to being able to put out content. I actually got my voiceover mic a little bit earlier than I expected. It came today, so I'm learning to work with that. I'm cutting up some of my first film for some scouting reports, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can about some of the guys I haven't watched extensive tape on so that I can get to work on my first mock draft. Awesome. I'm super excited for that. Uh, I'll see Gratz 1.0. It's going to be coming out. You know, I'm sure Ryan and I will put together some mock drafts, but they're not definitely not going to be as credible as uh, our guy Elson's is going to be. Today, it's in the title. It's strictly NFL. We're talking a lot of football. Uh, no guests today. That'll start back up next week. We couldn't get anybody to fit that into our schedule today, which is all good. Uh, but we got some. We, we do have some big news probably coming out next next episode. So make sure you tune in for that. Uh, but I'm super excited for this one because. It, we're talking football. It's just us three, and we're talking straight football, starting with the daily draft, and we we'll move down the list. Alton's got some some trivia for us, and we're, it's just going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm super looking forward to it. Let's get into it. We're going to start right away with the daily draft, and check out that beautiful leaderboard right there, huh? What a big week out of Ethan, myself, that's referring to. Nine, seven, and six. I got a two-point lead with a three-point swing coming on, as long as I don't get last. And, and Ryan gets first, I'm going to maintain first place going into next week. And I think that I'm going to be able to build a really good team. Today's daily draft is going to be building your our dream offenses. And so we got a little, little bit of a more, uh, unique one because we're going to have five rounds of with three people. So we got 15 total spots. Each person is going to have to draft a quarterback, a running back, wide receiver, tight end, and an offensive line as a collective group. Um, this can be drafted in any order. And so there's not it's just like first round does not have to be a quarterback, even though it might be first round does not have to be a quarterback and it's going to go in any specific order. Ryan's going to spin the wheel and let's see where we go. Yep. Here we go. The win is the wheel is spinning. First pick is going to go to Elson by a hair over Ethan. Mm. Elson's mm -hmm. going to get the first pick. I think I was, I wanted the first pick in this draft. Yeah, this is a good draft, I think, to get the first pick. Definitely. Second pick. This another close one goes to Ethan by a little bit. And the second overall pick is definitely not the place you want to be. I don't know. I mean, it depends. I think I I don't actually I actually think third is like the worst place um for me. So Okay. All right. All right. Well the, All the, right, Elson. depends on what Elson takes. Yep. Yeah, we'll we'll see where this draft goes, one might mm -hmm. say. Elson, who what position are you gonna go with and who is that respective player? So I got to clarify real quick. We're talking current offense or all time? I think current. I that's think, I, I, think we're, okay. I think, I think that's, current. Current. that's not, that is, me too. Me too. So this isn't going to be a fun pick, but I got to go Patrick Mahomes. He gets it done. It's a fair pick. I'd say, I mean, it's hard to, hard to not, um, that's a t that's gonna leave me in a tough situation there, Elson, because I kind of feel like after this season, there's not a lot of you know some of the quarterbacks that might have been two, three, four. There's a little bit of the, eh, who knows with them, but I uh, I'm gonna probably go with the running back category, and I'm gonna take Christian McCaffrey. I think when you have a position player, especially on the offense, that is in the MVP conversation, 
that's not a quarterback, I think that you got to you have to consider him as um, a first round pick. So I'm gonna go Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, I think that was the one. I think that was my first overall pick. If I had it, I think McCaffrey is the best running back um, by a lot. But then with getting two picks here, I'm going to take the top of two different categories, in my opinion, at wide receiver and tight end. To start off, I'll take Tyreek Hill and then Travis Mm. Kelsey on the wraparound. Okay, there you go. So, I mean, if people are looking at it and they're like, oh, got two of the top for wide receiver and tight end, I think there's enough depth at the other positions that I'll be okay. Yeah, I I would agree with that for sure. Um, I'm going to – I could go. There's a lot, there's a few options I could go, and this could really make make it make or break my seating here. Is it the uh, best player in the daily draft? By numbers don't lie, um, but I'm gonna probably. I kind of feel like I want to play my quarterback position as a reaction, so I might wait for Ryan to take his quarterback. I I think I have to go Justin Jefferson. I mean, he had some injury issues this year, obviously, but and it's obviously some inconsistent quarterback play. But I think Justin Jefferson, I mean, he's, I think, the best wide receiver in the game still. Um, so I'm going to go with Jay Jettas. So you win football games from the trenches. And, you know, if you got like a top three offensive line, you can basically create Christian McCaffrey in the aggregate. So we're going to go with the Eagles offensive line. I'm assuming that I get Jason Kelsey pre-retirement mid-year Eagles offensive line can't be beat. And then with the snake, I'm going to get some trade bait here. I'm going to take CD lamb, get my X receiver. Mm, That's hurtful, but I don't have a wide receiver to take with that. Not a smart. Allison doesn't know the the draft strategy, but that's okay. Yep. That's okay. Uh, It's so Allison, quick question for you. So you're telling me a good offensive line can build a guy like CMC. Would you do you do you think DeAndre Swift's in the same conversation as CMC? Well, again, it's all money ball here. So yeah, I mean, yeah, the Eagles offensive line, DeAndre Swift is basically Christian McCaffrey. You can quote me on that one. Wow. That one I think that might be po- talked on Twitter. And it's gonna be I think the word basically is gonna be trending on Twitter after that, uh after that comment by Elson right there. So we'll make sure we'll make sure that gets out. In my bet in my pick, correct? Yep. Okay. Um, I was kind of assuming that the fifth round was going to be the the quote unquote called the old line round, but I guess the old lines are going off the board. I'm going to have to take my tight end here. And while there are many really great options at tight end, I'm going to go with TJ Hawkinson. I personally think he's the second best tight end in the league. I don't think George Kittle's all of that height, maybe because he's a different type of tight end. And he's not exactly a ball catcher. He's more of a blocking um, kind of guy. But I think I'm going to go. I think I'm going to go with uh, T.J. Hawkinson with my pick. Okay. So now I've already taken my wide receiver and tight end. So now I just I got two choices for quarterback and running back here. Obviously saving the O line until the uh, the kicker round in fantasy football. Yep. Um, so for my quarterback, I'm going to go Lamar Jackson. I mean, he's going to get the MVP this year probably. I think that's for a good reason. So I'm going to take Lamar Jackson there. Um, and then for running back, I mean, it's really pick whoever you want. I think there's any answers really right here for the second best running back behind McCaffrey. But I think I'm going to take Kyron Williams. Um, in theory, he's got a lot Whoa. of years left. So I'm going to go Kyron Williams. You don't think he's like a one-hit wonder guy? No, I think – I mean, I think uh, if he is, then – I want last year, Kyra Williams. If not, then I'll take his whole career. <laughs> do you um, do, do you think that the college that he attended has anything to do with his NFL success? Couldn't even tell you where he went. Probably Georgia. Um, but... Notre Dame. Okay. That's okay. That's all right. Um, I'm going to go with probably who, the guy who does – he actually deserves the, the, the MVP this year. I'm going to go with Dak Prescott at my quarterback position. Uh, we might not win in the playoffs. We might not win in the playoffs, but we are going to have probably one of the most electrifying regular seasons in the history of the NFL. Uh, might be the first 17 or the, the, the most recent 17 and 0 team. Uh, but back to Allison for his last two picks. I can't tell you how happy I was when you picked TJ Hawkinson because to me, George Kittle 
deserves all of the hype. It's not that he can't catch passes. It's that he's so valuable as a blocker. So I am elated to get George Kittle. And then I'm going to go Travis Etienne, I think, for my running back. Wow. I mean, we're basically – I'll send – I, I hate to be that guy, but there's no way Elson wins this week, right? I mean, he took Travis Etienne just because he was on his fantasy team this year, and, and but then he ended up trading him to Freddie, right? I traded, traded him, him away. Freddie. There's no sense. You trade time. him away, and then George Kittle, where he's just building a team to block, and he's building a run first team. He's got Mahomes, but he's he got the Eagles in the second round or whatever, so that he could run the ball, and then he got George Kittle because he could block, so. He's got six blockers in there, and then he, he goes out and gets a receiving back. I don't understand. I would take the 49ers' entire offense if that was an option. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, okay, well, you, so you, probably, you probably could have. I mean, the thing is you probably could have if you would have taken CMC with your first overall pick. Then you would have been able – Ayuk was never drafted. Purdy was never drafted. The 49ers' O-line was never drafted. You decided would have taken Kittle in the second round. I mean, you literally could have taken the 49ers' offense. We're making yeah, trades. Could've. I'm trading away the players I got. Don't worry. Okay. I mean, I, I would be interested in CD Lamb. That mean I have to give up Justin Jefferson. I'd be interested but, in CMC. Okay. Uh, I would do. We can we can work something out there for sure. Yeah. Uh, but let me make sure I lock in my fifth round pick. And I am going to make sure I take. Uh, ooh. Hmm. I, I'm going to go to Dallas Cowboys offense. Of line, I'm gonna go with the Dallas Cowboys offensive line. I think that there's, you know, they're, they're they've been the best offensive line in the since the last. I mean, Travis Frederick, obviously Zach Martin, you know, probably the last 30, 30 years. I would say, the last thirty years, Cowboys have had the best offensive line. So give me the Cowboys. Healthy Tyron yeah. Smith's pretty good. Yep, I agree. And Zach Martin too. Even using my my Cowboys pen to write all these picks down. Um, so yeah, go Cowboys. Yeah, with my offensive line pick, uh, quick Google suit, quick Google search of a uh, power rankings. Colts were in the top three, so I'll take the Colts. I think that warrants a reason go. to take them. That's a good. That's a good reason why, uh, for sure, for sure. I was I was considering taking Ezekiel Elliott for my offensive line. I'm not sure if that would have counted, but um, we would probably have been the offense uh, opposite of Elson's type of team. We would not be able to run the ball because our our center Ezekiel Elliott would not be able to block anybody. But I thought about taking him for my offensive line. But, um, yeah, I, I think I probably have the best team. I mean, the That's Cowboys, I will say, if you drafted Zeke, the Cowboys have, like, a really solid passing average on plays where Zeke is the center. Poor first down percentage, but very good yards per time. <laughs> if, I, if I specifically drafted, like, the 2022 – Dallas Cowboys or like the 2021 Dallas Cowboys, like somewhere in there. Do you think I? Do you think Zeke Elliott's a part of the offensive line? Yes. You think he's included in that? Because I could specify that and get Zeke as a part of that. He could be my George Kittle. He could be my George Kittle. Well, I mean, if we're going back in time, I'm taking the Hogs and Joe Jacoby and Russ Grimm. So I okay. think that's a little bit of a slippery slope. I think we got to stick to this year. All right, we can stick to this year. I think that's a fair that's a fair move. All right, so uh, the the standings will be up, or I uh, should say, our picks this year will be up. I think that it's it's a little bit of a different daily draft because normally when you look at it, it's like you see everybody's first round, second round, third round, fourth round pick, but instead it's not going to be really who picked what players in each round, even though it should because Elson took the Eagles off the line like in the top three, but that's okay. Um, it's going to be like you're going to see each team's quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. It's going to be more categorized. And so that's how you're going to – it's going to be more of the question of who's got the best team is what the voting will be based on. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but, yeah, so there you go. Make sure you go on and vote. Make sure you vote for Ethan. Continue my lead. Let's keep growing that. Uh, two points is not going to win it, not going to win it for us. So uh, let's make sure we continue to grow that. Let's keep moving on. This week's second crop pick of the week highlights Ross's amazing talents. Check this out. Ryan, you think you could take this cool of a picture? I mean, I've taken a couple of pictures on the iPhone, but I'm not sure uh, anything's going to come close to that. So, I mean, that's another great picture from uh, Ross there at second crop. Absolutely. Um, once again, 
some people might call Ryan the Fox, but the, the camera never seems to not find Ryan, especially out on the basketball court. Okay. So, <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, another one of great picks from Second Crowd. Make sure you check them out. He's been, he's been busy, man. He's been busy out, out and about. He gets these really cool pictures of, you know, honestly, like Wisconsin's um, true colors with the the nature and wilderness. And then he's out with sports. He's doing pretty much all the sports team around Greene County. So he's he's been out kicking butt for sure. Um, so we, we've, we've mentioned this in the past, but if you happen – to know somebody who's interested in becoming our official or not really someone, but a, co- a business or a company that is interested in becoming the official podcast sponsor for us, let us know. Make sure you email us at riverbrands at gmail.com. Um, and, and we can, we can try and work something out. We're hoping that we can get some new equipment that will allow us to do some, some pretty cool things, be able to go to certain places and do shows from there. Um, as you know, uh, actually watching it back, it wasn't the worst in the world. Um, but the one we did from the alumni hockey game, it just the equipment quite wasn't there and our setup wasn't there, but we'll make sure that we continue to do that. And, you know, the summer is going to roll around and we're going to be doing some pretty cool things. So let us know at riverbrains at gmail.com. Blurry picture. Wow. I didn't even notice that, but Hey, the Seahawks, uh, I believe just today signed their new head coach, Mike McDonald, the Baltimore Ravens defensive coordinator. Alton, what are your thoughts on this? I get it. I really do. The Seahawks have had a lot of pieces on defense for quite some time, but they've really struggled to put it together ever since the Legion of Boom kind of disassembled. And I do think that Mike McDonald can come in and have that Seahawks defense playing fast. But I think with this really deep, rich pool of talent that they had to choose from and as, you know, one of the more prestigious teams, it just leaves a little bit to be desired. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, anything to add to that, Ryan? I mean, I haven't really heard much about him other than being the Ravens, but I think from this picture, he looks like someone who could be successful in the NFL. I mean, he kind of looks like one of those football guys that could lead a team to a playoff run. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, his, you know, thinking hist- historically in the NFL, people who have the first name Mike and their last name starts with Mick D, um, they're, they're and you know, like that, I think, they, there's been a good there's been a good tradition of head coaches that have happened, so I think this is a good hire. I like your comments on that. Trying to maybe try and reunite the Legion of Boom. Obviously, they're not the same players, but they have a pretty good defense with some good weapons, good youth youth guys, and a lot of um, good young talent on the offensive side as well. So I think it's a good hire. I mean, I don't see why not. Um, additionally, in the head coaching world, Ben Johnson informed the entire world of NFL that he's going to be staying in Detroit, which is kind of surprising because everyone thought he was like the number one guy to get hired this year. Um, Ryan, what is this? What, what would you say this has to, what, what's next year look like for the Lions? And then if, you know, at what point does Ben Johnson say, all right, I'm going to get my head coaching job? Yeah, I don't know. I think the Lions, I mean, they were right there. I mean, they were on the doorstep of making the Super Bowl. So I think if Ben Johnson is happy in a situation, I mean, I think it's great that he stays and, um, I think the head coaching job will still be available for him in the future, probably wherever he wants it, if he continues his success. And if he really loves this Lions team, um, I think it's fine for him to stay because, I mean, they were honestly like a player or two away from being in the Super Bowl, which obviously as a coordinator is all you can ask for. Yeah, absolutely. Elson, um, what's, we'll, we'll go back around. Uh, do you have anything to add on that, on the Ben Johnson co- subject? I actually do. Uh, I think this shows what a football nerd I am, but when the little notification from The Athletic popped up that he was staying in Detroit, I actually said, oh my God, because it was that shocking to me. I mean, the number one candidate in this year's coaching cycle. And the same thing happened last year. I think it just shows what a remarkable culture they've got going in Detroit. And as a fan of the Packers, no thank you to the Lions for, you know, the next five to 10 years, I am not a fan of what they're building there. And I am not a fan of them robbing the rest of the NFL and keeping that quality offensive coordinator. Yeah. Right. There you go. Um, So last question on the whole high coaching, there's one vacant position and that is over there in Washington. They hired some dude who's supposed to be professional hiring coaches with the new ownership staff. 
Who knows if they'll be called the Commanders in the next two to three years? Um, let's go around. Austin, we'll start with you. What's, who's your prediction? that will Who was going to fulfill that commander job? I got to go with Mike Vrabel because I do think they're trying to build a culture there. And I think he's the best culture builder available, if not just the best overall head coaching candidate. Brian? Yeah, I mean, talking about Vrabel, um, Vrabel sent a message to a member of the media that wanted him to come to Washington. And Vrabel said, Tell him to talk to me. So he's definitely looking for the job. Um, I think William Stefan Belichick might be the person to go there. Obviously, he has ties to that area. So, I mean, I think that might be a, a place for Belichick. And I hope that happens. I, I hope not. I Yeah, right. I hope it doesn't as a division um, opponent to the commanders. But I don't, I'm going to say this probably won't happen. But I, I think the guy I wish would go there is Eric Bieniemy. I think that he was so good, so good with the, the the Chiefs, and obviously the Chiefs have proven that they can continue to do that without him. But he went over to the Commanders to try and get a change of scenery that might increase his opportunity uh, to get a head coaching job, which is kind of odd. The only from going from the Chiefs to the Commanders, I don't know who would want to do that. But at the same time, maybe he's trying to prove that he can do it without Mahomes and Andy Reid and what they got going over there in Kansas City. But I kind of hope that he's got the, you know, hiring in house. I don't think they would do that because of the new ownership staff and kind of what their process has been like. But I, I would like to see Eric Bieniemy get that job. I think he's a good fit for the, for the commander's position specifically. Um, so that's gonna, that's pretty much all we got. We got one position, one, one uh, position available to be hired. That is the commanders coming up this year. So I'm, I'm excited to see kind of. Uh, where this goes with that and how we can kind of recap the, the, uh, this head coaching cycle as well. So we're going to review a little bit of the championship weekend. Um, a lot of people were saying it's going to be Niner. It's going to be Niners. It's going to be Ravens. The two one seeds, the Super Bowl logo, the two colors. But the NFL decided to choose the storylines. How could you not pass up on Taylor Swift making you 300 plus million dollars? And how could you not pass up? on the 49ers, like everybody predicted. But, you know, let's give Brock Purdy the role. I mean, what a great storyline. Storylines outweigh the logo colors, or do they, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, people are saying that maybe the purple is Taylor Swift's dress and speak now, or, uh, I mean, like, red's a purple uh, color that's in her album, so maybe they wanted red versus red, and she's going to go out to halftime and sing red. Uh, and Obviously, there's going to be hypotheticals all over the place, but I don't think the NFL yeah. is going to – I mean, there was definitely a call down at some point during that Ravens Chiefs game that we need the Taylor Swift numbers in a couple weeks. Yeah. Do you think if the Cowboys blue and silver show up on that Super Bowl logo next year, do you think I should be excited or disappointed because of what the recent trends from the last few years have been? I would say uh, you should not look at the logo. They should release the logo after the Super Bowl teams have been decided. Um, and then those are the colors. Yeah, I agree. I think that the the colors of the logo should be the two teams that are in there. I think that's that's what they should do. I think that's a good idea. And I do like that idea from from you right there. Um, Alston, what are your thoughts on what the NFL decided to do here at Championship Week and brewing up for a big Super Bowl? Well, I just wanted to add, you were talking about, like, should you look at the logo? Should um, you be excited? As a Cowboys fan, I would just assume disappointment every year. I would have to think it makes it easier that way. Oh, that's not nice of you. <laughs> wow. It wasn't a fun loss for the Packers either. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, you know, as oh. I was talking Cowboys fan, I, I think it's fair. All right. Elson, follow-up question. Um, is the Brock Purdy hate finally over, or is he still a game manager? Well, I think we've learned with the whole Mahomes situation, and it was kind of happening with Josh Allen too. Winning quarterbacks are just hated by everybody. You can't win for long periods of time in the NFL without everybody saying that you're overrated and carried by a good supporting cast and just growing to hate you in general. No, Brock Purdy's not a game manager. I think that there are elements of a system propping him up. I would probably put him more in the 5 to 10 category than top 5, but Brock Purdy's really good. And he's been really good. And sometimes people just got to use their head in some critical thinking and realize sometimes if you're not the best, it doesn't mean you're the worst either. Alston, I heard the uh, the fire alarm going off, the fire siren, I should say, in town. 
Is everybody's house is okay? No one's burning down over there? I'm good. I, I you're you're good. Looks like I'm okay. Yeah. Okay, Ryan. How about you over there? Are we all good on that side? Yeah, I haven't I haven't heard anything yet over here, so it must okay. still be good. Right. But I will good. say about Happy. about Brock Purdy. Okay. The questions are: Is he elite or is he a game manager? I think he's an elite game manager. I, I like think, it. Uh, yeah. I like it. I like it. I think that's a really great way to put it, for sure. An elite Rock's game manager. Right. Thank you. I, I mean, I kind of feel, <laughs> I kind of feel like that there are certain different types of quarterbacks. You know, you just look at the four guys in this picture. Lamar's a scrambler. I'd say Patrick Mahomes is more of an improviser playmaker. And I would say the two guys on the right, Jared Goff and, and Brock Purdy, they strive in managing the game. That is their strong suit. They're game managers. That doesn't mean they're bad quarterbacks. They're really good game managers. I would say, I would say Tom Brady is a game manager. That is his strong suit. I mean, yeah, he's got a really good arm talent. And even Aaron Rodgers, I would say, is a game manager. I mean, you know how many times Aaron Rodgers would like hurry to the line trying to, you know, catch a team in a, in a, a change or a substitute and he get a free play or his hard count? Those are game manager moves. And now that's not really the way the NFL is, is now. But I, I do see that these two over here on the right are game managers, but they're two of the more underrated quarterbacks in the NFL as well. I don't disagree that uh, Purdy and Goff are in similar categories, but when you know when you extend that tag to Aaron Rodgers, it sounds more like you're defining being smart as being a game manager, but I get it. I get what you're saying. Absolutely. There's such a thing as an elite game manager. Yeah, I think I think what you're missing is uh, Aaron Rodgers is a game manager who has the skills of like the greatest of all time, whereas maybe these people don't. So he's kind of both instead of just the game manager. Maybe. Well, I will say I, I, I will say that Brad Purdy is uh, however old he is, maybe twenty three or so. Uh, Aaron Rodgers at twenty three years old sure wasn't leading his team out to the the Super Bowl, especially I mean Aaron Rodgers' was first round pick as well. He was sitting on the bench learning, and so I would feel like yeah, I mean they they do have certain things, but I don't really feel like the two guys on the left. I wouldn't classify them as game managers, and but I also don't see them going up to try and make the quick move. I mean. It is part of the, the philosophy that the Chiefs have is, but, you know, they're trying to kill a clock. It's third and seven. What are they going to do they're, instead of taking a knee to run 40 seconds off the clock? No, they're going to take a deep shot to Marquis Bell that's scaling and, and, and ice the game like that. Those are, like, he's, those are improvised. Those are playmakers. Those are, that's the way Patrick Mahomes plays, whereas the other two guys on the right side, those guys aren't going to be able going out and making that play. It could be the system, but I think that's just the style of play, and that's how I kind of view it. Any comments on that? I think all of that is reasonable. I mean, you got stylistic differences between all of them, even uh, Purdy and Goff, because Purdy, I think somewhat famously now, has like an elite 10-yard split, which you see show up all the time when you watch the Niners, where he is uh, almost finding ways out of broken plays and just squeezing everything he can get out of their system, whereas Goff has... Uh, for lack of a better term, cinder blocks for feet. And so he is more that game manager role where he's taking calculated risks. But I think your general assessment is correct. Just uh, if you have any doubt about Aaron Rodgers, maybe watch some Aaron Rodgers free play highlights and you'll see him getting that ball downfield a little bit. I, mean, yes, I don't have any doubts. I was more so complimenting him, I feel like. I mean, he is more so, I think, He's a very, very good game manager, as, as I think Brad Purdy. He's a better game manager than Brad Purdy, but I think that he is very, very good because of what he can do with um, those free plays or some of the decisions that he makes. But like, I, I, I foresee him. I mean, I, I think a field general game manager, I think that go hand in hand. Jared Goff is probably one of the best guys in the league at reading defenses. I would put Jared Goff in the reading defense category as Tom Brady was, and they are both very, very good at that. I mean – I feel like any time I watch the Lions game, all through the playoffs, I feel like the announcers really made the point that defenses, when they talked to the defenses during the week, that they really tried to make sure that they had a way to disguise their defense from Jared Goff because he was so good at reading their defenses and knowing what coverage they were in. So I kind of feel like that those, I mean, th those are just qualities of game manager play, whereas 
Lamar Jackson's if he's getting, he's not really. Re, I mean, he might be reading defenses, but if he's he's gonna go, you know, drop back. If no one's open, he's gonna run, or he's gonna try and throw the ball up in the air, get it tipped, and catch the ball himself because he thinks he's Marcus Mariota. But I think I, I don't. The two guys on the left, I think, just play a different style than the two guys on the right. And I do think that Aaron Rodgers and I do think that Tom Brady play a similar style to the two guys on the right. That's just the way I foresee it. I entirely agree. Lamar Jackson, well, I shouldn't say that. He's getting close to what Marcus Mariota was. Yeah, I mean, we didn't see Lamar Jackson score a touchdown on that play. I think it was roughly, was it, was it the same yardage? I think, did they both get 13 yards on that? They might have, but I, Lamar Jackson clearly did not score a touchdown. Like like um, Mariota did. Can't argue with that. Yeah, I mean, numbers don't lie. Yeah, yeah, that's objective. Yeah. Um, last big headline from the championship weekend. Um, what Ryan? What are the thoughts here with the uh, Justin Tucker versus Kelsey and Mahomes situation that happened? Yeah, I thought that was actually kind of funny to see. See there with uh, the warm up situation with kickers being on both sides of the field. It's kind of the the gray area where they are, and Kelsey was just defending his quarterback, I guess. He felt like he needed to do that. I'm not sure why Mahomes couldn't move over two or three yards, but um, right. I don't know. I mean, I'm probably on Justin Tucker's side in that situation. Yeah, Alson? Completely unnecessary. I mean, that was an act of bullying. There is no reason that a guy who is already proven he's the best kicker in the NFL needs to be picking on that quarterback tight end duo. I got to side yeah, with them because I, imagine Justin Tucker walked up to you. You're shaking a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Justin Tucker is kind of a nice guy. From what I've heard is that uh, there are certain phases of warm up supposedly where um, like at the beginning, early, earlier, but like kind of, you know, maybe, I don't know, an hour before the game starts or something. I don't know that where there's really, you can, players can be on the entire field because it's more of a special teams time. It's for punters, kickers to kick punt and they're able to kind of go on both sides of the field where there's not really a split halfway down but during this specific time it was the period where you are split down halfway and you stay on your half and Justin Tucker was not on his half that's the way I understand it um and, and under that regard I don't blame him but um at the same time I feel like Justin Tucker is kind of harmless and I don't really necessarily think I could be wrong but I don't really think that Justin Tucker intentionally placed this stuff right there and was doing everything that he was doing to try and get under the skin of Patrick Mahomes. I don't think, I mean, it wouldn't be a good idea to fuel up probably the best quarterback in the NFL might be the greatest of all time, 10 years from now, but it might not be a good idea to fuel that guy with anger before the game starts. That's just a personal thought, but who knows? I don't know. I just feel like uh, if that is true, maybe that's kind of how it go. That's, that's that. But um, I didn't notice that uh, Kelsey, he made some comments, obviously, on New Heights, and then he was also on the Pat McAfee show today. He was talking kind of about it, and uh, it was it, he. He said, "Just don't be a jerk." And so uh, I, I don't know what words were said. It didn't seem like a whole lot, but in that game, watching it, it kind of seemed like Kelsey was just out for. I mean, out for blood. It almost seems like after every play, he was starting to fight, but he did it well enough where he was drawn flag from the other team because of the retaliation aspect. It just kind of seemed like any, Ryan, did you, did you notice that at all? Yeah, I, I would say that like Kelsey was kind of playing, uh, obviously he drew the personal follow, like you said, uh, but he kind of playing a little bit more like aggressively like that. So I don't know if people calling him soft yeah. got to him or what? Yeah. Um, Elson, here, here's the last, let's, let's talk one last little bit with the Lions. Um, and Dan Campbell, do we think that Dan Campbell did lose that game for the Lions? Or do you live and die by the memo of that team that's really going forward on fourth down? Well, I, I wanted to address one other thing quick, like about your uh, Kelsey comment, and I totally agree. Okay. And I think more what it is, is during the regular season, his yak numbers were way down yards after catch. He just wasn't creating the way he normally does. And I think mm -hmm. we're seeing some signs of age where, you know, he's more willing to go down during the regular season and during the postseason, he's more willing to take those hits to the knees and the thighs and to deal with some of that soreness because now he's playing for the Super Bowl. So that's just my hypothesis there. But as for the like Dan Campbell fourth down type of deal, I'm on Dan Campbell's side, in all honesty. I don't think teams go for it on fourth down enough. 
I think that people struggle to realize that every time you don't pick up a fourth and short, there's a time that you do pick up a fourth and so short. So just because it went wrong and just because multiple of them went wrong doesn't mean that it was the wrong call because if they picked those up and the Lions got the W, we would be calling Dan Campbell a gutsy genius right now, I think. Yeah. Um, the way I, so, so supposedly there is an opportunity to go up three scores earlier in the game, but they decided not to. I was not watching the game during that part. I was preoccupied. And so I don't know about that situation. But the, the one that I was confused about was late in the game when they had a chance to tie the game. They were down three, 27-24, about six, seven minutes to go in the game. It was a fourth and three, and they were inside the 30, and they decided to go with it. That one, I don't honestly, that one I disagreed with because of the situation. You, you live and die by fourth down. If it's fourth and two, and sh- short two, or if it's fourth and one, I, I say go for it. I think those are definitely opportunities. I think that he is kind of starting a new wave in the NFL of going for it on fourth down. But I would argue that it is fourth and three, six minutes to go. You're playing the best team in the NFL, arguably. And you're down three and you're looking to tie the game. It's not like a situation where you're, you're in a lose-lose situation because if you're giving the ball then, you're going, you're, you're, you're like, they're going to score either way. It's not really one of those situations. I thought there was plenty of time we can get the ball back. Your defense, you have to trust your defense a little bit too. But I thought in that situation, you have to kick the field goal, no matter what. I didn't really think that there was any question at all about going for it because of the opportunity to tie the game and that there's enough time to get the ball back. And it wasn't necessarily – it was I, in my book with NFL kickers, it was a chip shot field goal. Now, here's another follow-up question to you, Ryan. And if you have any other comments, I'm interested to hear them. Uh, do you think Dan Campbell just does not trust kickers? Do you think he just got something out for the kickers? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely like a possibility. You might like not. He's obviously like a tough football guy, and he might be under the belief that like kickers aren't like football players, and he doesn't want the game to like come down to a kicker's foot, and he wants like the players on the field to decide it. I think that might be somewhere in the back of his mind. Um, but I mean, if that's his philosophy and he's the head coach, then that's that's what the team's going to do, and that's part of yeah. what the Lions hired. Yeah, and it seems like I, I heard something. I don't remember where I heard it, but I heard something where it was, you know, these guys are more happy to lose with Dan Campbell than to win without Dan Campbell. And that's just the kind of guy he is. This team loves him. And I there's talk – I mean, there's pretty much – they've said Jared Goff's going to be back next year with the contract extension. And so I'm, I'm excited to kind of see where this goes. Elson, any final thoughts on this? I just want to say – Maybe this is a little bit of a reach, but I was playing this uh, college football game on my phone quite some time ago, and I couldn't recruit a good kicker. The guy I had was really bad. He would miss chip shots from time to time. And so I looked at kicking as something you do with your back against the wall. I started going for it um, every two-point conversion, and it honestly worked out pretty well. I think over like a 12-game season, he ended up kicking like five field goals and like 12 extra points so like dan if you're hearing this just call me up i'm open to it love it love it love it all right let's move on from championship weekend to super bowl weekend we're going to be previewing this super bowl um travis or i'm sorry travis kelsey's future wife taylor swift's dress purple dress that's the purple and then you got both teams this red mixed in over there at the top uh, quick question though for you, Ryan. Is do you think Taylor Swift's going to make a special appearance for the halftime show? No, I don't. I don't think so. But I think she is going to. She's going to be at the Super Bowl, so that she might watch this halftime performance, and she's going to think, "Oh, I mean, that's absolutely terrible. Usher is out of his prime. Why is he the one here?" And next year, she comes back, and she sings the halftime show at Travis Kelsey's game, and it's this whole thing. And mm. Travis Kelsey stays out for halftime. He doesn't go in there, and then the second half, he mm. doesn't know the game plan, and he. And he fails. He's the reason they lose. Might that be the next uh, topic of Mad Talk Sports that we might hear about? Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Okay, maybe next year. But you heard it here. That's a, that's an early prediction for next year's Super Bowl. Um, one question, though, I, I, I'm actually interested to hear, and we'll, we're going to dive deeper into this next week, uh, into the whole Super Bowl. But I'm, I'm interested to see, uh, like, set an over under line about how many times during the Super Bowl, ha- like, the performance, that the camera pans to Taylor Swift watching this and trying to catch her reactions to the show. I think that'd be very interesting 
to hear. I don't know. Ryan probably could set a good line. Let's not set it now. Let's not set it now. I mean, we'll, we'll set it next week, and then we'll kind of see how that goes. But I, I'm interested to see that one. Um, early predictions. Also, who do you think is going to win this game? I've been saying 49ers all year, and I'm not going to change that now. I got San Francisco. What about you, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd lean towards the Chiefs just because I don't really think you can you can pick against Mahomes. And I don't know. I think the Chiefs are – they have what it takes to keep winning, and they've shown that they can do it in the past. Yeah, I think it just seems like the Chiefs have to just because of their success and their track record and the Taylor Swift thing. It's hard to bet against that. But, the you know, they're not – if the Chiefs win, they're not going to get another week of Taylor Swift. It's now or never, and I think it's finally time. Let's get Brock Purdy's Super Bowl ring. Let's get, you know, the whole Ed Ed McCaffrey and Kyle Shanahan's dad whole thing, and now they won a super, multiple Super Bowls, and now Kyle Shanahan and Christian McCaffrey have an opportunity to win a Super Bowl. I think they're going to go after that one a little bit more. I'm probably going to lead a little bit more to the 49ers. Uh, I'd more so want the 49ers to win, but we'll see. We'll, we'll dive into this next week. Um, any early headlines that we should be should be aware of at this point in this one? I mean, kind of a, a repeat of four years ago, Super Bowl. I think people will talk about that. Um, but the headlines, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Mr. Irrelevant, if he wins one, I think that might be something that people, something people talk about. Yeah, I, I think that's very viable. Also, do you got any that we should be uh, keeping our eye out for? Well, I think Ryan really covered it. I mean, that is an all-timer. Mr. Relevant from two years ago, taking the team to the championship. I mean, you can't write that. I believe that the best Mr. Relevant before Brock Purdy was uh, Ryan Suckup, the kicker. So Brock Purdy's a step up from yeah. that. That is pretty awesome. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, that's gonna we'll, we'll dive into that deeper a little bit next week. That'll be kind of one of the main topics for next week. We got a little bit of NFL sidekick draft update. Elson, obviously, we talked a little bit at the beginning of the show. You're you, you're getting pretty close to producing some content. While you've been doing that, though, you've been still continuing to look into the NFL draft and some things coming up. We got any updates for us? Any new uh, developing stories? A senior bowl? Anything from that? Just give us a little bit of an update. Okay, so two guys I've really got my eye on that I think have been shooting up boards are Quinion Mitchell, who is a cornerback from Toledo. And he is fascinating. I'm honestly surprised that it took um, the media so long to start giving him the respect that he deserves because he was actually incredibly productive at Toledo. He is fast, instinctive. He has ball production. The big thing with him is he is an off-coverage corner. His press mm -hmm. experience is basically non-existent. And when they did deploy him in that role, he just doesn't know how to do it yet. And the big question is, oh, can he learn? Because in theory, he has the size to. And I think, I mean, if he hits, you are talking about a legit number one quarterback. I also saw a mock draft recently that had him at number four overall. That mm. was from like CBS. Don't get me wrong. That's insane. That's not going to happen. But I really do like Quinion Mitchell. And then another guy that's been shooting up boards is Devontez Walker from North Carolina. We've seen uh, North Carolina produce a lot of good receiver talent recently. And Tez Walker is no exception. Just a great size speed combo. And those are the type of players that you usually see fly off the board early. So those are two big risers that I've really liked. Kool-Aid McKinnistry is a I'd say probably the biggest faller in the cycle mm. so far. And I just hope it doesn't go too far. Because Kool-Aid is not like um, oh, not Kyer Elam, the guy that fell last year from Georgia, whose name I can't think of right now but he fell to like the fourth round after being mocked in the mid first for quite some time. Kool-Aid is not that. What Kool-Aid is, is a pro ready press corner who can be a CB2 on day one. And sure, he doesn't have elite long speed, but he's going to be really productive. And who he reminds me a lot of is Joey Porter, who fell to the second mm. round last year to the Steelers. And people were saying, Okay, who's going to take him? Who's going to take him? Are the Steelers really going to get him in the second round? That's a steal. He's going to play on day one. And he did. And he was really good. And so that is what I see from uh, Jaquincy Kool-Aid McKinnistry. 
And then as for the senior bowl, it's still early. We haven't seen the game. We're just seeing some uh, 1v1 action. But Tavondre Sweat, versatile defensive lineman from Texas, incredible athlete, is showing off that incredible athleticism, and he's been great so far. Roman Wilson, receiver from Michigan, is climbing. He's just smooth, good route runner, really cementing himself as a day two receiver and making a push in a really good wide receiver class for day one. And Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, he hasn't been that guy so far. And that's not overly surprising because Xavier Leggett, I would probably say, is in the 10 to 15 range. So I'm a little bit lower on him. And don't get me wrong, I love what he can do. He's an incredibly physical, tough receiver. And I think that he has a high floor. But those aren't the kind of guys that shine at the Senior Bowl. You're looking for flashy route runners that are breaking ankles and tracking the ball well there. And so that's just not the right event for Xavier Leggett, but I do think he can be a really productive NFL receiver. Those are some of my early takeaways. Yeah. Um, one question regarding Tez, regarding Tez Walker out of North Carolina. Early in the season, he has like that suspension due to like a faulty transfer type thing. Is that something NFL teams kind of take into account that could kind of take his draft stock a little bit? So... I'll be honest, I don't actually, I don't know the exact Tez Walker situation. I know what you're talking about, but I haven't gotten into like a background evaluation on him. I think that the transfer stuff doesn't play as much of a role in NFL decision rooms as it maybe does for fans. I've okay. noticed that, I mean, you don't want a guy who's going to be an off the field issue because right. that's publicity. That's a whole different thing. But I think in terms of the team loyalty type of stuff, teams take talent first. That's yeah, my... it, it, it just seems like a, a transfer issue isn't really necessarily an off-the-field issue. It seems like one of those things that might have been maybe a slip-up in paperwork, paperwork. Like you said, I'm not sure about the exact technicalities. I just heard about it, like watching college game day and things like that. But I don't think that's really necessarily like a behavioral issue or a uh, a reputation issue that an NFL team would have to to worry about, would it? I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I definitely don't think so. Don't quote me on this because I'm not certain, but I believe when I did dive into the Tez Walker situation a little bit, I concluded that basically he didn't do anything wrong. There was no malintent at all. It was God, just so, some life situations okay. kind of got in the way, so I don't think that's even remotely a red flag. So it's a little bit more of an NCAA situation. Yeah, you know, Tez Walker. Okay, got it, got it. All right, well, there you go. Uh, we're ready to go. We're super excited for Elton's NFL Psychics first round 1.0, or m maybe it's a little bit longer, but a 1.0 NFL draft, mock draft. Um, and super excited to see where some of those guys on the screen might end up. But let's go into a little bit of the NFL trivia that Elton has prepared for us. Oh, Ryan and I, we're going to work together. Unless we want to compete against each other, um, whatever we want to do, but I, I thought we could work together and see which one of Alton's trivia questions we can get correct. But if Ryan really wants to compete against me, I guess we could. Nope, we can work together. All right, let's work together. Alton, what do you got for us, my man? Okay, so we're talking all-timers today in terms of all-time leaders and categories, and I'm going to be nice here. I'm not diving into the uh, West Chandlers and Raymond Berry's and Sonny Jurgensen's, these are all guys that have played meaningfully. Yeah, all guys that have played meaningfully in the 2000s. But they're guys that kind of stood out to me where I wouldn't think that they would be that high. And so my first question, and I'll help you along when you guys need hints, is the number three all-time rushing leader. Anybody know who that is off the top of their head? Frank uh, Gore is Frank Gore number two. I know Emmett Smith's one. Frank Gore is up there in the top four. I, Sean McCoy is up there. I don't know I who's Frank, what number. I think Frank Gore might Frank Gore might be three. All I know is that Frank Gore has exactly sixteen thousand rushing yards. It is Frank Gore with sixteen K. Yeah, it, it's right on the head, isn't it? Yeah, um, Frank Gore, one of my favorite players. I had to include him Me in too. that. Maybe not the yeah. guy that people think of when they think of top five all time running backs, but. He just produced and produced and produced. He was he was a beast. I know that for sure. Yeah, I I learned that one from Madden when I'm trying to. I'm at about year six of my Madden franchise. Probably the last one I'll do this year, 
And uh, I'm, I've, I've got some guys that I'm trying to get up there in the rear rushing yards, and I realized that by looking at the record book for Frank Gore. So I'm chasing him at the 16K. Okay, so I'll give you a little hint on the next one. It's kind of in a similar vein. The number time all-time receiving yards leader. The number what? Number two. Number two all-time receiving yards leader? Yep, he played so his entire behind? career with one team. Okay. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald was the first name that came to mind. Um, I was thinking about- Megatron, but I don't know if he has that many yards. Megatron didn't play for that long. I, I feel I yeah. Feel like his career was but the, the, Yeah, that's true. But the one, the one team his whole career, that's what kind of struck me. Uh, I mean, Larry Fitzgerald played forever. He's an option. Um, I'm trying to think. I've been staring at those record books because I have guys that I'm trying to get to the top of that. I'm trying to think who that number one guy is. Or like the top five at least. Some notable names. I think I mean number one is uh Jerry Rice. Rice. Yep. So I'm trying to think what other receivers played for one team, um, other than Fitzgerald. Marvin Harrison? I don't think he's number two, but he's up there. You guys can lock it in. Larry Legend is the correct answer. All right, all right, all right. With about uh how many rush or how many receiving yards did he have? He had about seventeen and a half thousand receiving yards. And then this is the number 16 all time receiver. And he's also the receiving yards leader for active players. Certainly not in his time, but he's DeAndre Hopkins. Number 16 all time. DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, It is not Hopkins. He is second. Okay. My, Um, my two, my two guesses would be either Stefan Diggs or Devante Adams, but I know Diggs is up there. It's, it's one. It's Julio Jones. Julio Jones. He's playing for the Eagles. Quintoris Lopez Jones. Correct. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. I knew. You I know where I, Stephon I, Diggs is. I feel there? like I've seen that one before. Stephon Diggs, Diggs didn't long. come up for me. I bet he's top five among active, but top five or top ten. Okay. Let's see. This really struck me when I was looking at the all-time interceptions leaders. This player has the most interceptions of any active DB, and he is 118th overall. Mm. Any immediate guesses? Jalen Ramsey? It's not Jalen Ramsey. Otherwise, Stephon Gilmore, maybe. I don't really think he's much of an interception guy, though. This player was an elite draft prospect when he came out, and he's done some work as a return man, too. Uh, hmm. Veteran. Second letter of the first name. P. Patrick Peterson. Pat Pete. Yep. With 36 is 118th all time. Yeah, I sure got that one with the return man. That should have struck my, my thought with that one. That's a good one. Yeah. Anything else you got for us? Yeah, I got two more. So right. this is the really hard one. I wanted to make sure that you guys would get the one at the end. But the number six all-time rusher, this player played for the Patriots and Jets. Mm. When did he play? He played – he was in his prime, I believe, late 90s to mid-2000s. And I just – I did not see him being this high in rushing yards. Those are the only two teams he played for? Yep. And he was Jets most of it. I believe those were the only two. He was drafted by the Patriots and then had his prime with the Jets. Hmm. I feel like the, I feel like I, I know the name, but I... Do you want it? It's got, like, it's got like a W in there somewhere. and It does not have a W in there anywhere. Well, it's somewhere. It's somewhere in like the middle name, I think. Ah, okay, okay. It does have uh, his uh, <laughs> last name starts with a reversed W. Um, okay. Do you want it? Give yeah, I don't know. First initials. Uh, give us the initials. The first second. C M. Chris. Not Chris. I don't think I know the person. Then. Curtis. I'm Mark. lost. Curtis. I don't know. I've never heard of that guy before. Ah, uh, yeah. I would not have imagined he was top ten. Really good running back, though. And then the last one is the number eighteen all-time passer, and man. He is elite. Recently had a resurgence, you could say. 
Flacco. Joseph Flacco. There it is. And that's what I've got. So I think you guys got right. five and six. So that was good. That was a good performance. That's not bad. A round of applause for Allison with those NFL trivia questions. Um, make sure you check out his, his YouTube channel coming up with some of his content, and maybe he'll produce some NFL trivia questions for his viewers. Who knows? Who knows what he's got planned? We're going to stick it in the NFL world. Keep it there. Um, coming up, I believe, tom- tomorrow. No, next Thursday, right? Next Thursday is coming up is the NFL Honors where they will announce all of the awards. I believe it's the Thursday of the Super Bowl weekend. Not this Thursday, but we got Pro Bowl this weekend, which is super exciting. We're going to go through the seven big awards uh, and kind of give us give our pred- predictions for each of the awards. We're going to start – let's start at the bottom with Coach of the Year. Um, Allison, start us off. Who do you think is going to win Coach of the Year? I haven't checked the odds recently. I would assume this is chalk, though, Kevin Stefanski. With what oh. he's done with that Browns team, I mean, come on. All right, all right. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, I was surprised to see Steichen wasn't one of the finalists, but I think uh, Dan Campbell uh, definitely – has a chance to win that award. I think Dan Campbell too. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with a different guy. I'm gonna go D'Amico Ryan's. I think with that team and the difference between last year and this year, I think very. I mean, I think all three of these guys are. They, I mean, they all got to be the front runners. I mean, I think that they're all nominated, obviously, but I think those those are three very uh, very talented guys. Let's go with comeback player of the year, starting with Ryan. Yeah, I mean, there's one person who, if he wins, it's just an absolute shame. But I'm going to go with Joe Flacco. Absolutely, I agree. Elson? Not to take anything away from DeMar Hamlin, but I got to go Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield, okay. I'm going to go Joe Flacco as well. I think that would be a good one, to, good one to see. If it's DeMar Hamlin, it would be a little bit of a sad story. But he did have a nice little fake punt at the playoffs. So. Uh, defensive Rookie of the Year, Elson. I'm going to take Devin Witherspoon here. Okay, interesting. Ryan? Uh, I'm going to go with Will Anderson Jr. Okay. I'm going to go, I think this is his name, Kobe Turner from the Rams. Is that right, Elson? Is that fact check truly? That is correct, and I love that pick. I think that he's a good one. I think he's a little bit under the radar. I mean, not necessarily. He's got some of the best stats out of all rookies, but I don't think many NFL fans really think about uh, Kobe Turner as a possible defensive rookie of the year candidate. So I'm going to go with him. Uh, let's go offensive rookie of the year with Ryan. I'm going to go with uh, CJ Stroud. CJ Stroud. What about my boy, Elson? Puka. I'm also going to go Puka. I think Puka deserves it. He broke – I mean, he, that guy was insane. I think just because of where he was drafted is low, low expectations to, to very, very good compared to high expectations staying very high. I think I'm going to go with Puka as well. Let's go defensive player of the year, Elson. I'm going to take TJ Watt, actually. TJ Watt. All right. Ryan, you have the same thing. I got TJ Watt. Okay. I I was going to go Miles Garrett. Uh, I thought Miles Garrett had a really good year. It seems like just watching Red Zone, it just seems like, boom, Miles Garrett had a sack, or boom, Miles Garrett had a forced fumble or something. Um, Although my boy Micah, I don't really think Micah deserves it this year. I don't think that he had such a great year because he was getting held all year, uh, but that's okay. Offensive player of the year. Let's go with Ryan. I mean, this is kind of a stupid award because MVP exists, but um, Christian McCaffrey will win offensive player of the year. All right, Elson. I'm going Tyreek Hill because uh, you'll see on the next one. Oh, okay. A uh, little bit of a teaser there. I'm going to go with C.D. Lamb. He was better than Tyreek Hill this year. Um, just because Tyreek Hill had more yards, but C.D. Lamb was a better player, and he was a little bit more valuable to this team, in my opinion. We're going to go with the MVP. Give us a nice little explanation of why we should have been preparing for this pick, Elson. Look, I know you can say Patrick Mahomes is the most valuable player because he's a quarterback, but give it to CMC. I mean, come on. What more can you ask for? Absolutely. I agree. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, for picking who we think is going to win the MVP, I mean, Lamar Jackson is going to be the pick for me. There you go. I think that Prescott deserves it. Stats don't lie. Uh, they're not – MVP is not voted on postseason success. And I'm going to go with my boy, Dak Prescott. That's, he deserves it, in my opinion. 
Right. Um, any final remarks with that, um, with the, uh, the picks there? For Offensive Rookie of the Year, this is just a shockingly good class. Honestly, I think they should take the trophy and they should cut it into three parts. They should give it to Stroud, Puka, and Laporta. I agree. I think that'd be very good to see. I feel like a guy like Jameer Gibbs, in a normal year, Jameer Gibbs would, would win the Offensive Rookie of the Year. You know, I just kind of feel like there's not normally these many really good rookies. And I just kind of feel like, you know, Jameer Gibbs, he was a difference maker. Stats aren't great, but sure. You know, he, he was good enough. I think he'd win it. You know what I mean? I think it's usually one of those situations. But um, he's not really – He's. I think he was nominated, but he's not really in the conversation. I don't think – I think he's – most people have ruled them out. But, all right. Let's go to our Move Forward Good Moments. Uh, each week during the Move Forward Good Moments segment, we highlight the good moments in our community. This week, we are simply here to remind you that Move Forward's charity hockey game is March 9th at Slice in Monroe. As always, proceeds benefit Big Brothers Big Sisters of Greene County. This year, Move Forward is projected to surpass the $50,000 mark in funds raised for their community. So make sure if you're bored and looking for something to do March 9th, come on down to Slice and Monroe for that. You saw it. Um, pretty much the entire episode down to the bottom right hand corner uh it probably won't be the last time you see it down there we like to give updates on some of the new things that are happening for sure but i think that's always going to be a fun one uh we're getting to this thick of it here getting towards the end of the show uh looks like my picture is not showing up that's you can see in the top of the screen um but it's supposed to be a little bit of a cheesemaker sports update type thing we're just going to check in on each of our seasons um Elson, you're not currently in a season. He's a big cross country guy. Believe it or not, people do enjoy cross country. I'll say that actually, do you enjoy cross country? Yes, I love cross country. I hate running 5Ks. Okay. All right. Uh, take that for what you think of it. Um, Ryan, how's the basketball season going? Big win over Bigfoot last night. What's, what's the outlook kind of looking like here? Yeah, that's what's been good. We have a, uh, Three games in four days coming up this weekend, so it'll be a little tough stretch, but it'll be a good it'll be good for the playoffs. Yeah, there you go. Um, I was talking to Dutch a little bit earlier today. Is is conference a lock, or what do we got to do to kind of lock the conference up? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, we, there's definitely there's still like oh, there's probably five more games left, so it's it's not like locked up. It's, um, but I think we control our own destiny. There you go. There you go. Um, I'll give a little update with hockey. Uh, we want, we beat Reedsburg up uh, up on the road last night, three to two. Um, with that being said, we have to beat Sauk Prairie. We also do we play Stoughton Saturday. They're in our conference, but they're not very high in the conference standing. But Sauk Prairie, if we beat Sauk Prairie on next Tuesday, we will take second place in the uh, conference. And Edgewood's in our conference, so they don't really count. Um, they should be in a private school or in the Big A or something with some of those Madison schools. But yeah. Um, Cheesemaker Hockey, I don't think I've ever finished even in the top half of the conference, let alone second place. Uh, there's been a lot of things that we've done this year and even last year that uh, have never been done before. So that's super exciting for the hockey program, definitely going up. Um, I think we're starting to kind of figure some things out. But Tuesday night's game, Tuesday night's game at home against Sauk Prairie, I think we were – I was kind of talking with my parents. I think uh, – that might be like the biggest game that's ever been played at Slice. I'm trying to think, you know, um, my freshman year with a Bantam, so we had our state championship game. State was held in Monroe. Uh, we had the state championship game there, but that was COVID, so it wasn't really super big showing, and it was just it's youth state, not not really the city doesn't really care about that. But high school, uh, this was kind of a big game with with the game against Sock. We went up. Um, the, I think the, it was the last game before Christmas break that Friday, and we, we lost in overtime up at their place. So it's going to be a really good game, I think. I don't know if Monroe has actually ever beat Sauk in our, in our program's history. You have to consider uh, Monroe has not – our hockey program actually has not been in existence that long. I think like seven or eight years have – but it's been club before then, so it was like a club program, so it wasn't that big of a deal. And then um, the COVID year – so it would have been my freshman year when we stayed back and played Bantams. They, the high school team was a club team that year because uh, there was no high school hockey season. So they played club. And that year, they were very, very good. They would have been, they might have won the conference uh, that year, but it was a club season. So they, it really wasn't a conference. So um, 
But I still, I still think that this might be the biggest game ever played a slice in the existence of the place. So it's, it's super exciting for sure. Um, let's talk baseball. Alson, uh, baseball, you know, I think we're, we're looking good, I think, for baseball, wouldn't you say? Definitely. I think uh, made some changes. The culture has shifted, I believe, for the better. When practices start, I think we're going to be cooking. Yeah, I agree. I think uh helps that we're in a, a new conference. I think we'll have a little bit more of a level playing field. Some of those that Badger Conference, I mean, the amount of kids they get. You know, in Badger Conference schools, it kind of seems like the spring sports baseball. It's a little bit more of a popular spring sport, I think, in Monroe, like more track. I feel like track gets the most kids. Tennis now. Tennis seems to take over. We had Bordner on the chat yesterday. Um, by yesterday, I mean last week. My apologies. But, yeah, I think baseball is going up. I'll say one thing, though, um, that I – one of the feelings that I have with it, um, and I'll be very honest, is I feel like the adapting to change is kind of hard. Do you have any of that feeling at all, you know, going into your senior year, you know, having a, a new coach, kind of a new culture, new environment? Do you feel like that adapt – the the process of adapting to that is at all difficult? It's definitely a process, and adapting to change is never easy. However, I think it'll be easier for me maybe than for most because freshman year was my first season of baseball, or actually any sport for that matter. So it's yeah. been a learning curve the whole way for me, and so I think I've become more accustomed to uh, adapting to changes, and I'm really more excited than anything else to see how this season plays out. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, it's just like for me – I feel like the hard part is is the, the program's in really good hands. I think it's really good for the program. I think um, Coach Newcomer is very qualified. I think he knows a lot about the sport. And uh, hopefully, you know, now in the Rock, I think hopefully the, they, the program will start to win some games. But I just kind of feel like in the same breath, um, for me, like when a new coach comes in, they're not coaching, you know, for that for that particular year. You know, we see it in the NFL, they're, you know, they're trying to build and, and it just kind of seems like, you know, this, this specific year, um, it might not be as rewarding as it might be for even this year's juniors or some of the younger kids that are going to be able to kind of build up through this process. And so that, that part's kind of hard for me, I'll be honest, but I think, um, I'm, I think that the program's really going, going well. And I think that there's really a bright future and I'm excited to be a part of it and, and as a senior, try my best to uh, help it do whatever it, it can to be successful this year and setting it up for success in the next few years. You're not lying. I mean, I've thought about that, too, in that being a senior in a new uh, coaching situation, that's not the ideal situation. You want to get all the years that you can with your coach because, like you talked about, so much stuff changes. Uh you can expect different instruction. You can expect just uh, team functions to be conducted a different way. And you wish that you got that all four years. I definitely do. So as a senior uh, in the new coaching system, to me, it's just about going out there and attacking this year and leaving it all out there. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree for sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to – kind of excited to see what kind of goes on with that and uh we'll we'll continue doing updates like this i think doing some more localized things is kind of good uh for what we got so good luck to you ryan with the basketball season the rest of the way and uh uh we'll, we're going to try and win some more games in the playoffs Monroe's never won a pl playoff hockey game before and so hopefully we can try and do that and uh we'll, and then we'll we got the baseball season to look forward to as well with us and so um, super excited for that. Our last segment of the day is going to be a new one. Uh, we're going to be going into this segment a little bit um, in in the future. Is we're going to be answering some chat questions. Obviously, um, we're not really the chat on YouTube, but before, prior to the episode earlier today, approximately seven hours ago, I posted a thing on our Instagram story, uh, letting people know that the episode podcast will be live at seven thirty tonight. Blah blah blah, like normally. And I also posted an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, that we would answer on the podcast. I think this might be something that we try to do a little bit more um, going forward. And it doesn't necessarily have to be sports related, but it could be um, just normal, you know, whatever. Maybe you want to get to know us or whatever. So we got we got two questions that were asked that we're gonna we're gonna talk about today. 
Um, first question was over by my dad, actually, <laughs> and, uh, at R&R. &R. He, uh, he asked the question, I quote, are EV vehicles better than gas, i.e. Tesla versus everyone else? What are our thoughts? Let's start with Ryan. I mean, I think it's... Can you guys hear me? One of my AirPods died, so I'm with only one AirPod now. Oh, yeah, we got you. Okay, good. Um, I don't know. I think it's kind of an interesting idea with the whole EV. I'm not totally like a car guy, so I don't know how everything works, but I think it's an interesting idea if it really is better. I mean, I think either way, it's kind of a personal choice. Yeah, also, let's hear your uh, car knowledge that you got on this. So you said it was Tesla versus everybody. I am a big fan of electric cars, never had one, but I mean, I could see that being something in the future for me. However, if it's got to be Tesla, no can do. I am the original Elon Musk hater, and that is a take that has aged like wine for me. So, can't mm. be Tesla. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I don't know. I kind of feel like there's good and bad with it. It's like it or not, it's the new future because of Elon Musk. And now, these big, big, uh, big names like Chevy, Chevy and Ford and all the other big manufacturers are all switching to it. They're cutting a lot of their um, vehicles, like regular gas vehicles, maybe like sedans and stuff, because it's not really the current wave. And they're replacing them with EV, and that's where they're prior prioritizing. Um, and it, I think it is interesting that some of these vehicles um, and the amount of power that they can actually brew from a battery. I think that's super fascinating to learn about, um, but also there are those those factors about the batteries and and what those can do. But in hindsight, too, I mean, it, it's got to be good for, um, you know, the environment as well. Other than you know these fires, I think battery fires, if I'm not mistaken, are not any good for the environment at all. So that's another thing to consider too. But I mean, yeah, it's. It's an interesting topic, and I think I don't remember which one of you said it, but it's more of a personal preference thing, I think. And I think it's interesting to to kind of see how this goes. And another thing that's kind of interesting too is it seems like I'm I'm an architecture guy, kind of, and it seems like uh, that some of the new buildings that are being built um, are including, especially some of the more um, commercial buildings, you know, stores, banks, restaurants, those types of places. They're being built with actually like you know, electric car charging stations. And so I think that's kind of an interesting thing as well. Like I know one of our local banks here in Monroe, uh, they have, a, they, they get a new building and they got an electric car charging station thingy in their parking lot for their customers to use. And so it's kind of an interesting thing going forward. Uh, second question here was by Tim Overt, um, the guy who streams all of our hockey games. He's asking, which hockey player is going to be mic'd up on Friday? Um, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I'm sure you guys have no clue, but, um, it's probably going to be Cole. It seemed like Cole had a little bit of interest, which I'm going to warn you, Tim, uh, uh, you know, you might be, be ready for the, the bleep button. Uh, but yeah, you know, Cole's, I think he's going to be all right. He, he wants to get mic'd up. So I think he, he, uh, he might take that game. We'll see. And, uh, but yeah, I think Cole might get the game on Friday against the force. So, um, there's that one. Um, I got a question for you guys. Last question of the day, and then we're going to sign off here. Um, I think I might have asked Ryan this question a little bit earlier, but I was thinking about this. Um, hypothetically speaking, when you dream at night, would you be satisfied with your life if all of your dreams at night came true? Anybody got any thoughts on that? I, I think the answer is no, just because I think like so many – unpredictable things happen and probably there's like just as many negatives as positive and there's probably like enough bad things that happen that you wouldn't want that to happen i, th I think that's fair elton do you would you would you at all be satisfied like ryan said it really does depend i mean sometimes it feels like the real world is less predictable than your dreams but it depends on which dreams we're talking i mean if we're talking like the uh, becoming a professional NFL analyst ones, sure. If it's like the uh, uh, paper cuts on eyes from the Kool-Aid man ones, I'm going to stay away from those. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one too. I mean, there's some really good ones. You know, you're dreaming one night and you're living your best life down in Hawaii. You're, you're a multimillionaire. You know, you're rich. You got the perfect life. You know, those ones are great. And clearly, I'd be satisfied with that. But then the next night I fall asleep and 
I, uh, my house floods and I witnessed my dad get eaten by a shark. So there's certain, what goes around comes around. And so obviously if I'm going to witness my dad get eaten by a shark, I'll, I'll be honest. There's some days that, you know, him getting eaten by a shark might not be the worst thing. I just don't really want to watch it. And so I think, uh, I'll, I'll love that, but I'm just saying, um, I, I kind of think that there are certain, you know, that what goes, you know, it gets good one day and then the next day it's not so good. Uh, I guess it's whatever day I eat ice cream before I go to bed. But yeah, I think it's, that's an interesting question. That's, that's funny to think about for sure. But, um, with what that being said, it was like that? a lion or what, like, is it that your dad getting eaten or the fact that it's a shark? That's well, that you're well, there, well, there's two sides to that. You know, some days I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see him get eaten. Um, and then there's some days, you know, no matter what happens, I don't want to witness it. If he's going to get eaten by anything, I don't really want to watch it happen. Um, but, but, you know, I'm just kidding. But, yeah, if it's a lion, obviously, if my house is flooding and a lion is eating my dad, I think that the lion's not going to be able to survive because they're not much of a water creature, especially underwater. But um, I, I don't really know if there's really any animal that I would think would be interesting to watch eat a human. Uh, maybe a snake. I think a snakes have an interesting tactic where they kind of like wrap you up and then they like like to suffocate you and then they start munching on you. I think then that might be a little bit of an interesting one to to uh, to watch. But I don't really think I have any interest in watching someone get eaten by any creature at all. But uh, interesting question there, Austin. There you go. So um, if you're watching, make sure next episode we'll probably do the same thing. So if you're interested in asking us any question at all, obviously there's multiple different varying, varying questions. Uh, we're super excited to answer them and, uh, and kind of engage our audience a little bit more. But that's going to wrap up this edition of the River Podcast. Next week, like I said earlier, we're going to be announcing a new podcast that will be joining our productions. Super excited about that. Additionally, we will be diving into the Super Bowl with some hot takes and previews. But until then, I'm Ethan Rollinsteel with Ryan Matheson and Elton Grotz saying so long.